Hello everyone, Professor Philip Travis, and this week we are going to be examining the Byzantine Empire, Byzantium, and the Islamic world. Two major, significant geopolitical and cultural entities during the period in the aftermath of the collapse of the Roman Empire in the Mediterranean. And these two entities have a tremendous role in shaping the course of Mediterranean and Western European history for many, many years to come. Our readings for this week, we are reading chapter 10 from Patterns of World History, our textbook, which deals with this subject, of course. There will be a reading quiz this week. Please give me a day or two to get that quiz posted. I want to make a few changes to it. Uh, so that it best reflects uh, what we're reading and covering this week. So reading quiz this week on chapter 10. I also have a, a lecture, as always, and this lecture is on the emergence of the Islamic world. So I wanted to give us a look at some of the geographic and political realities and give us some history here of the greater Mediterranean world at this time, the time from roughly 500 until 1453. Why 1453? The reason 1453 is chosen is because that is the time when the city of Constantinople was finally defeated and captured by the Ottoman Turks, a, a moment that is generally considered to be one of the real turning points in history. And the fifth or the sixth century, the 500s, the reason we choose that is because that is the period when the Byzantine Empire really reaches its, its zenith as a geopolitical and an economic force in the Mediterranean world under the leadership of the king Justinian and his incredibly significant and influential wife, Theodora. So let's, let's walk through some, um, some geographical or geopolitical lessons here on this map. So first of all, when we think about the Islamic world, the Islamic world centered more than any, anything else on three holy sites. The first and foremost, of course, is Mecca. And Mecca was a very, very sort of ancient holy site predating the Islamic world. Uh, Mecca is the place where in an Islamic individual's lifetime, in a Muslim's lifetime, that once in their life, they're supposed to try to make the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca, and to come to see the Kaaba in Mecca. So an incredibly significant holy center. And please note that the, the, the points that I'm, that I'm showing for you here on the map, these are general locations. In truth, Mecca is a little bit further to the south, but this map does not include the entirety of the Arabian Peninsula. So please note, these are just general references about the whereabouts of these locations. So Mecca is one of the core holy sites for the Islamic world. Also Medina, located a little bit to the north. And of course, also Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a very important holy site for the Islamic world. It is, of course, a very multicultural city. Um, it's a city of great importance for Jewish people, a city of great importance, obviously, for Christians. It's also a city of very, very significant importance for um, Muslims and the Islamic world. It is in Jerusalem where, where Muhammad is believed to have ascended to heaven from the Dome of the Rock. And so Jerusalem is the third holy site for the Islamic world. These areas, and now this is not to say that Mecca was always the sort of geopolitical center of the Islamic world. In fact, the most important cities during the period that we're talking about in the Islamic world are cities like Baghdad in Iraq. Iraq is over here, but you would not be able to see Baghdad. It would be off this map. Damascus, Syria, which is over here. Also Aleppo, Syria are very significant geopolitical centers um, at this time though the religious centers are obviously Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem. The Islamic world in the south, and of course the Islamic world will spread across North Africa and all the way up into Europe, which we'll talk about in a moment. The Islamic world very much competed and also engaged with 
the world centered around the Byzantine Empire and its city, Constantinople. Constantinople, of, of course, is named after the Emperor Constantine, and it was a city that was established and founded under the Roman Empire. Now, it had been a fishing sort of uh, location for years and would have been known as Byzantium. It becomes known as Constantinople following the sort of establishment of it as a centerpiece of the Roman Empire by the Emperor Constantine. Constantine, of course, is the emperor who is usually associated with, um, with beginning the process of first legalizing Christianity and then eventually seeing Christianity become the state religion of the Roman Empire, ultimately. Uh, that sort of all begins with um, Constantine though Constantine is not the one who formally made it the state um, religion, though he does, um, of course, with the Edict of Milan, he does oversee the legalization of Christianity in the Roman Empire. Constantinople is an incredible city, and uh, it was a very, very well-defended city, and this is one of the reasons why it was not actually conquered by the Ottoman Turks until 1453, because it was an incredibly well-defended city. It had multiple tiers of walls on the western land side of the city. Um, this was first the Constantine Wall, and then later the Theodosian Walls, both named after Roman emperors, Theodosius, Constantine. In the city of Constantine, there are incredible engineering marvels as well, like the Valens Aqueduct, also named for the Roman emperor Valens. Constantinople was a thriving and bustling city, uh, a city with, with markets, with theaters, with a myriad of different types of events, including uh, a very, very large chariot racing track. Um, the chariot racing was a huge thing, the hippodrome as it was called, and chariot racing was a huge thing in the Byzantine Empire, much like it was in Rome. The Byzantine is not in any way, shape, or form a republic. It is a monarchy. And actually, political factions used to, used to use the chariot races as a way to sort of voice their sort of political anger or their political will towards the emperor in the Hippo Hippodrome. And in fact, in 532, the emperor Justinian was almost overthrown um, in a revolt that started the Nika revolt, which started um, at the Hippodrome. Justinian was going to flee, and eventually his wife, Theodora, who he very much loved and who had come up through very humble beginnings and sort of worked her way into the court and ultimately to marriage with Justinian, Theodora effectively was, was like, you have to stay and you have to fight for, 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 your, for your monarchy. Um, she, re, she, she really inspired Justinian to stay. Justinian stays and ultimately um, destroys his enemies in 532, tricking them to go to the Hippodrome, where he ultimately had, because the Hippodrome was like a horseshoe-shaped racetrack, and so there was like one entrance, and he tricked them to go in there and then oversaw their, the murder of all of his, these, these revolting political opponents. Justinian is really, uh, during the 500s, he is the ultimate Byzantine monarch, and he oversaw the greatest expansion in the Byzantine history. Now, generally speaking, this, this oval depicts for you more or less the sort of geopolitical realm of the Byzantine Empire. Under Justinian, it expanded to a much greater extent than that, very much establishing, and this is on the eve of the emergence of, of Islam. Islam, of course, um, had not yet emerged um, really in a meaningful sense until the beginning of the 600s. Justinian is in the 500s, okay? Justinian, in a lot of respects, during his time period, had reestablished, if you will, Roman control. And this is kind of how he saw it, reestablishing Roman control over the greater Mediterranean realms. In fact, the sort of capital of the Western Byzantine Empire was in Ravenna, Italy, which is located near Venice. And to this day... Um, the the church in Ravenna, there's a very famous cathedral in Ravenna, and you can see tiled mosaics of Justinian and Theodora with their various courts. 
um, and their various their various um, religious figures, military figures, um, and, and so forth alongside of them. And it's pretty incredible. It's a pretty incredible uh, piece of history um, there in Italy today, associated with the expansion of the Emperor Justinian. Uh, so in a lot of ways, Justinian actually kind of reestablished control over much of the old Roman Mediterranean. But like the Roman Empire, it was it happened fast, and the Byzantine became overextended. And after Justinian's death, uh, the Byzantine Empire really ultimately, during the majority of its time, uh, would have been focused on an area really depicted in this oval, uh, influencing most Turkey, Greece, Bulgaria, and portions of southern Italy uh, most during this time period. Justinian, by the way, too, in his own right, I mentioned some of the building of uh, pre-Justinian Roman emperors, but Justinian is associated with building what is arguably the most impressive uh, building project uh, to that point. And this was the building of the Hagia Sophia, or Hagia Sophia, the great church, which is today a mosque, um, located in Constantinople. Constantinople is today Istanbul. And it is a massive, massive, massive uh, cathedral with a dome that was of just incredible proportions. Um, the dome did collapse once. They made a mistake building it. They colla collapsed and they had to rebuild it. But um, it, it's incredibly significant testament to the vision and to the power of the Byzantine during Justinian's realm. The Byzantine Empire, in a lot of senses, was kind of like a buffer to Western Europe because as the Islamic world here expanded, the Islamic world expanded, seized territories, established caliphates, established new imperial domains. And the Byzantine Empire was, of course, an Orthodox Christian empire. And the Byzantine fought battles with the, the, the caliphates of the Islamic world and it's incredibly well defended location. I mean, even Attila the Hun was not able to seize Constantinople. Because of that location, it probably prevented the Islamic the Islamic caliphates from more thoroughly invading Central and Western Europe. Though it should be noted, and I will show you this in a minute, that the uh, Islamic caliphates do seize control not only of the greater Middle East, but also Egypt, North Africa, and all the way up through Morocco and into Spain, and even fighting battles in southern France, which I'll mention in a moment. So the Islamic world was very expansive, and they established a tremendous and long-reaching influence in the Mediterranean world. Now, in 1071, and I'm going to give you, by the way, I'm going to give, I think I might give us maybe three or four bonus points for this one, because I know this is running long, but this is important stuff, and I I think it's it's worth talking about. Um, one of the most significant elements in the expansion of uh, of the Islamic world was actually uh, was were, were, was a group that was not Arab, for example. They weren't from Saudi Arabia or the Arabian Peninsula. I'm talking about the Turks, and particularly groups like the Seljuk Turks, and then later the Ottoman Turks. And the Turks were individuals from Central Asia. They came from places like the area around the Aral Sea, which you cannot see on this map, but if you were to take, if you were to draw a line from the Black Sea and go east, you would run into the Caspian Sea and then the Aral Sea. And this is the region, these, the Central Asian region, where the Turks kind of, kind of emerged from. And they were noted for their equestrian skills on horses and for their incredible military prowess being fast-moving um, and difficult to fight um, a military force. And they would ultimately sack Baghdad, which was a sort of uh, the political centers of the Islamic world. Again, like you know, Baghdad, Damascus, Syria were incredibly important political centers of the Islamic world. And they sacked Baghdad. They began to adopt to Islam uh, and they assimilated to uh, Islamic culture in their own way. And they began to expand and pressure the Byzantine Empire. And it was in the Battle of Manzikert in 1071 where we start to really see the Byzantine Empire lose control over Anatolia, or Asia Minor here, of Turkey. And eventually you see the Turks expand to control more and more of this area here of Anatolia. And eventually, Constantinople will be all but surrounded uh, by the time of 
of the Ottoman Turks. The Islamic empires also, under the Umayyad Caliphate, expanded and advanced all the way into France, only to be defeated by Charles Martel at the Battle of Tours or the Battle of Poitiers. Charles Martel, of course, is, if, if you will, the, the ancestor in the line of the Frankish kings and the eventual Carolingian dynasty led by Charlemagne. Charles Martel was succeeded by Pepin, who was then succeeded by none other than Charlemagne or Charles the Great, who is the Carolingian king, the Frankish king, associated with being the Holy Roman Emperor and associated with the Carolingian dynasty and really arguably being the most significant uh, monarch of the Middle Ages, ruling a, a territory across Western Europe, a loose empire, of course, and we will talk about this in subsequent classes, but ruling a loose empire across Italy, Germany, France, Austria, and so forth. After the halt, the Battle of Tours and Battle of Poitiers is significant here in France because it stopped the expansion of the Islamic forces into Western Europe. And so just as the Battle of Manzikert really is kind of marking the slow decline of Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire to the forces of the Islamic Turks, the Battle of Tours is sort of the moment where Western Europe is able to prevent a further spread of the Islamic empires, the Islamic caliphates into Western Europe. Spain became long-term associated with the establishment of an Islamic caliphate, particularly the caliphate of Cordoba. Uh, now, the caliphate of Cordoba, it lasted about a century and a half and then broke up into some smaller caliphates. But Spain uh, has a, a great deal of influence from Islamic populations following the invasions of, of the Umayyad Caliphate. And ultimately, a great deal of migration of Islamic individuals from North Africa came to Spain, influencing its architecture um, and, other, and other elements of, of Spanish culture. Now, in 1492, the time of Ferdinand and Isabella, who of course would commission Christopher Columbus to sail across the Atlantic eventually to America, though Columbus had no idea that America was there. But that's another story. Um, Ferdinand and Isabella were responsible for unifying Spain um, as a Catholic Christian state, and in that sense, pushing off the remnants of, of the Islamic populations from Spain, as well as persecuting and pushing out the Jewish populations of Spain. But the Caliphate of Cordoba you see pictured here, and the Caliphate of Cordoba was a, Cordoba, uh, was a, a caliphate in which you had a hierarchy of Islamic people at the top, Jewish people in the middle, and then Catholic Christian populations were in the bottom rung of the, of the economic and social and political hierarchy in the Caliphate of Cordoba. Though the Caliphate of, Caliphate of Cordoba, it should be noted, is associated with being a highly, um, a highly tolerant and advanced um, political entity for its time. And so it was a pretty diverse makeup uh, social makeup, and in that sense, it was it was pre considered considered pretty tolerant for the time period. Even if there were very distinct social hierarchies with very much different types of justice and law for people within that social hierarchy. What is the factoid for this week for three points? The factoid is generally the Caliphate of Cordoba. But you may sum up any part of this for the factoid. But generally speaking, the Caliphate of Cordoba in Spain, a remnant or a long-term element of the influence of the development, growth, and expansion of the Islamic world. But you may select any element that you find interesting to talk about. Email it to me no later than Wednesday by midnight. Get your three bonus points this week because this was a long one. Maybe I might even give you four. This was a really long one, but I hope it's enjoyable. Everybody learned something here. Um, and let's have a great week. I'll see you in the discussion forum.